Hello everybody, um, a very warm welcome back to the Lockdown Lit Fest. As ever, the entire team, all of us working hard and working pro bono, hope that you're all keeping well. We hope that you're keeping safe, being alert, and we hope that you're being looked after and looking after the people you love. Um, we're rather honored today to have um, something of a keynote guest, um, a name that many of you I'm sure will recognize. Jonathan Porritt was co-founder of Forum for the Future, an eminent writer, broadcaster, and commentator on sustainable development. He established in 1996 Forum for the Future, which is now the UK's leading sustainable development charity with 70 staff and over 100 partner organizations, including some of the world's leading companies. Jonathan has been a director of Friends of the Earth, co-chair of the Green Party, which he's still a member, of course, chairman of UNED UK, chairman of Sustainability Southwest, the Southwest Roundtable for Sustainable Development, a trustee of WWF UK, and a member of the board of the Southwest Regional Development Agency. He's also a trustee of the Ashton Awards for Sustainable Energy, and is involved in the work of many NGOs and charities as patron, chair, or special advisor. It is therefore not surprising that in January 2000, he was awarded a CBE for his services to environmental protection. His latest book is entitled Hope in Hell, a decade to confront the climate emergency. And it's a rallying cry for urgent global action against the climate crisis in which Jonathan takes a refreshingly optimistic standpoint and argues that there's still time to do what needs to be done to fight climate change, but only if we act now. Jonathan Porritt, a very, very warm welcome to the Lockdown Lit Fest. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us. How are yeah. you, first of all? Pretty good, thank you. Um, I, I can't say I'm enjoying lockdown exactly, but it's been perfectly bearable and I'm in Cheltenham, so it's been a nice place to be locked down, um, but I can't wait to sort of get a bit more normality into the system, I must say. <laughs> it's... I think that's, true of, uh, that's sort of true of the entire lockdown team and uh, so many of our audience, of course. I used the phrase, let's come to the book straight away, actually, because it's a fantastic book. As I said, the title is Hope in Hell, A Decade to Confront the Climate Emergency. The phrase that I used was refreshingly optimistic standpoint. Um, given that we hear so much doom and gloom through most of the broadcast media, most of the mainstream media, where does the refreshing optimism stem from, Jonathan? <laughs> yes, it is counterintuitive, I have to admit, but the reality if you, if you look at it the reality is that we have so many things working for us already in terms of addressing the climate emergency we pretty much have all the technology we need really and truly we do we have some brilliant stuff we could do to restore nature and simultaneously address the climate emergency we've got more and more people aware of what needs to be done and keen to get on and play their part in doing it we've got the incredible new emergence of young people's energy in the scene. We've got all of these things going for us. Um, we have not got sufficient political will to bring all those solutions to the fore, to make the investments that have to be made. But the reason why it's, I'm sort of refreshingly hopeful at this stage is because I actually believe that the COVID-19 crisis will engender a new sense of purpose and urgency in our politicians around the world. That's why I can sort of sit here and say, yep, hope is still a really valid response to the state of the planet today and to runaway climate change. If memory serves with everything from Tokyo Accord or, or, and Kyoto Agreement and so on, we are looking, the, the agreement has been that if we can keep global warming down to two degrees per annum, that's still the target. We, it seems that there are various differences within that. Um, given that everybody is loving that we have bluer skies, we can see the stars, we are listening to birdsong, is this where some of the optimism is coming from, from COVID, that people are, have, a, have a glimpse through COVID, awful though it is, of course, of what is possible in terms of climate change, that we could get back to this as a normality rather than a rarity. And is there a way of doing that without having a COVID every year, I suppose, is the big question. We certainly can't sort out the climate emergency by having a wave of pandemics devastating <laughs> our lives and our economies. That is, that is not the way anybody would want to do this. But I think we can take heart from the fact that people have seen for themselves what happens when you take a lot of cars off our roads 
Our air quality improves immediately. You take a lot of planes out of the sky. We are having greater clarity in terms of uh, the atmosphere. We've sort of got an understanding now that these are good things. And not just in a country like um, us here in the UK, but in India, for instance. I've been doing quite a lot of work looking at India, where they are able to see distant vistas that they've never seen before in their lives because the air pollution is so bad. In many of those Indian cities, this is the first time they have been able to see blue skies at this time of the year. So in India, citizens are already saying, we are not going back to that. We are not going to go back to that kind of polluted hellhole because the one thing we've learned now is that we can achieve clean air, even in big Indian cities, and we want it. So for me, there's going to be a big push on the politicians not to take us back into that uh, polluted environmental misery, but to use the, yeah, the, the learning of COVID-19, a lot of which has been very painful, but some of which has been really positive, to use that learning to put back into our lives all the things we really want but not to put back into our lives all the things we don't want and we can't afford. Let's, while we're talking about political will, where are we with that? I was talking to Lewis Pugh a couple of days ago, who is, as I'm sure you know, United Nations uh, patron for the oceans. And he was saying that the pro one of the problems is that large supranational organizations such as United Nations Environment Assembly are being undermined with various presidents around the world sort of taking the World Health Organization's feet out from underneath it, that maybe there's not the international sense that there was, through the work of people like Greta Thunberg, I suppose, to really marshal our resources and focus on climate change. And if we do undervalue and or sort of undermine our uh, supranational organizations, we're going to find this even more difficult. Are you seeing that this is going to be an increasing challenge as we try to get multinational accord? To try and bring yeah. to try and bring climate change under control. Yeah, no, it is a huge issue. <laughs> I'm not going to offer you any uh, false optimism on that score, Paul. I'm really not because you can't do the job we need to do on climate change or on big environmental issues. Uh, you know, ocean plastics or collapsing yeah. ecosystems, biodiversity. You can't do it without these uh, big international institutions, supranational institutions, creating the the right mechanisms, putting in place the right balance between sticks and carrots, the, 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 the need to provide incentives, but the need to use sanctions if, com if countries don't fall in line. You can't do it. So the current weakening of UN institutions in particular, and President Trump's attack on the World Health Organization at this stage is, is almost unbelievable, frankly, and so irresponsible. But a lot of those agencies, particularly the United Nations Environment Programme, for instance, have been yeah. very weak for a long time. They're desperately underfunded. So that is a big challenge. And when I talk about political will, I don't just mean our politicians in a particular country. I mean the readiness to engage with other uh, champions of change through these international organizations. Of course, COP26, which was due to be held this year in, in Glasgow, yeah. has of course been postponed because of uh, coronavirus. Can you explain to me, I'm, I'm very intrigued in this, and, and forgive my naivety and probably stupidity, but given that we've had COP25, and therefore 24 previous COPs, what is COP doing? What is COP there to do? And is it functioning properly? Is it doing the job that it's set up to do? It seems to me that it's a hell of a talking shop, and it's good that the conversation, the dialogue continues. Is it having any effect? Yeah, well very different views on this as it happens. The trouble is it's a much less effective mechanism than we need. It's basically the one point in the year where all the politicians, some you know, up to prime ministerial level, so head of state level, yeah. come together to move forward the measures that have to be taken to address the climate emergency. So it is a really big milestone every year. But in truth, over the last, as you, as you quite rightly pointed out, over the last 25 COPs, conferences of the parties, we've made so much less progress than we should have made. So it's, a, it's an inadequate vehicle, but it is a necessary vehicle. And the disappointment at the postponement of COP26, the conference of the parties that was to have happened in Glasgow at the end of this year, is that we're going to miss a whole year. 
And there aren't many other international fora where people can come together and do some of the hard edged brokerage, the decision making that needs to happen. There, there was a time when we could rely on G20 meetings, for <laughs> instance, to move things along in that regard. But you know who is making absolutely sure that we won't make any progress through G20, that's for sure. Yes, he seems to have it in for G7 as we speak. And uh, one can only yes, imagine exactly. that, that G20, despite a, a number of former prime ministers of this great nation, uh, are trying to convene, a, a, Indeed. Or, uh, suggesting a, a, a convention of G20. It's only a matter of time, one feels, until Trump sticks his oar in there as well and mucks things up. Um, it seems to me, in my very naive sense, that there's a hell of a disconnect between the will of the people to have a better environment for us not to destroy the very planet that we call our home on one side of the argument, and on the other side of the argument, the will of developing nations, of course, to develop their economies. One thinks of China and the exponential growth of coal-fired power stations at the CERN and so forth. Is, I mean, do you, is there any sense of optimism that we can do both things, that we can help develop countries develop in a sustainable sense, whilst also trying to protect the planet? Absolutely, and that is one place where if you are looking for reasons to be hopeful, this is definitely one of them. And that is partly because the incredible surge in investment in renewable energy means that both solar and wind in particular are available now at an incredible scale at a cost that is outcompeting every other form of energy, yep. every other form of energy. I was just looking, I mentioned India before, I was just looking at the pri relative prices of a unit of electricity from solar versus a unit of electricity from coal, and solar is about half as expensive. So Prime Minister Modi, for instance, is pushing really, really hard on solar. He's not completely out of coal yet, guess why? He gets a lot of votes from people <laughs> who want to see the coal industry thriving, but he knows that in terms of rural areas in India, and addressing rural poverty, by far the most important technology in the world is solar power. And this isn't just a one-off, Paul. This technology goes on getting cheaper yeah. every year, every year, every year. And other forms of energy, they're finding it almost impossible to compete now with renewables plus storage, because you have to have the storage to bring the electrons into the grid at the time when you most need them. But that combination, will be the dominant energy system within five to 10 years. So I'm hugely hopeful about that because in fact, then it becomes the fastest route to reducing poverty in many of these very poor countries. So on that score, I feel okay. I'm more nervous about what you touched on in the first part of your question, which is politicians represent an incumbent blockage on all of these new ways of doing things. We've had 40, 50 years where Fossil fuels have been so dominant in our lives. They have literally played the deciding factor in country after country and still do. And those big oil and gas barons are not letting up in terms of their pressure on the politicians. So that incumbency, what I call the fossil fuel incumbency, is basically the reason why we need more political uh, will addressed to dealing with that incumbency and allowing nations to create prosperity without trashing the planet any further. But as you intimate, politicians who tend to have fairly short-term aims and ambitions are still very much in thrall to lobbying by the oil companies. Why it is changing. Well, yeah. the, the question I was going to ask is, what are the politicians doing lobbying the oil companies to try and change their contribution to global decarbonisation? Yeah, it's, it is changing. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to make it too simplistic. There is a generational issue here. Right. It tends to be the older politicians who have just become so used to their dependence, symbiotic dependence on big oil and gas. And younger politicians are much less invested in that idea. They can see the way the wind is blowing, as it were. They can genuinely see that people today, particularly young people, of course they want all the benefits that a really reliable, um, affordable energy system brings them, but they don't want the side effects. They do not want unbreathable air. They do not want accelerating climate change. So when you track what younger politicians are saying today, it's a very different story. And for me, what I'm 
suggesting essentially in my advocacy around this is we need to accelerate that transition. We need to move the old guard, the incumbency, out of the way faster so smarter, younger politicians in particular can step up to that plate and can say, yep, we're going to protect your quality of life, material standard of living, all of those things, but we're going to do it differently. And we're not going to do it at the expense of everything we hold here in the natural environment and everything we owe future generations. This is not the kind of deal we're going to support any longer. So that's the story. It's there, but it all comes down to the politics. I like the idea that it's fossilized thinking as much as fossil fuels that is the problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Can, you give, can you give me an example of who is getting this right? Which younger politicians are, are leading from the front that we can look to as, as, the, as the flag wavers? Yes, I mean, we've got really outstanding leadership now in a lot of European countries on this. So in the Scandinavian countries, um, in Germany, despite Germany not having yet got rid of all its coal, the astonishing transition towards renewables is quite remarkable. Um, we've got leadership in many different parts of the world which shows what can be done. Most of it, however, is still not moving fast enough. So you started, Paul, by mentioning this threshold of not exceeding two degrees centigrade, temperature increase by the end of the century. A lot of scientists now say it actually shouldn't be more than 1.5 degrees oh, centigrade yeah. rather than two, but nonetheless. So, to do that, we have to move so fast. And the trouble is the pace of change is just too slow. The leadership is there, the recognition is there, the investment money is there. There's no shortage of money, no shortage of money, no shortage of technology. It's all about getting this transition moving faster. And that's why I emphasize the importance of leadership in young people. I, I don't know what listeners to this, viewers of this will feel, but for me, 2019, the most inspiring thing in my life throughout 2019 was the leadership from young people. Um, with this wonderful inspirational example from Greta Thunberg, who was a real game changer. I mean, she moved from a single person strike outside the Swedish parliament to encouraging, inspiring 7 million young people to be on the streets of cities all around the world within the course of a year. It's one of the most extraordinary social movements I've ever witnessed. And that energy in young people is still there. It, it, it can't achieve the same during the coronavirus crisis because everybody's locked down, but it is still there. And it is gonna come breaking forth again with all of that vigor, that integrity, that incredible ability to speak truth unto power, which I, you know, in a way I feel some of us have, have lost the, the trick of. So that's where I draw it huge amount of energy and inspiration for the future. I mean, it's, it, it's fantastic for raising awareness, and I'm a huge fan, obviously, who wouldn't be, of Greta. But the question I constantly ask myself is, is it going to make a difference? It's all very well speaking truth to power, but as we saw with her, um, her presentation in front of Trump, is power listening? Let me put this another way. Do you get to talk to the CEOs of BP, of Exxon, of Shell, of the big oil companies? Are they listening? And what are they doing? <laughs> well, I used to, Paul. You mentioned a few companies that Forum of the Future did work with. And, and, and I have to, you know, I've said this before, but I have to own up to a certain amount of naivety on my part because we worked for more than 10 years with BP and Shell and genuinely thought we were helping them down the road to a, a low carbon transition. Absolutely. It, it turned out, that was not the case. It was an illusion. They did not want to move away from their tried and tested way of generating profits out of selling more and more uh, oil and gas and so on. So we stopped working with them. We're, we're not for profit. We can't possibly work with companies that are not serious about their commitment to a low carbon future. And none of them are. So I don't want to back off from the fact that not everybody is going to be comfortable about this transition. There are going to be lots of losers and including lots of people who are invested in and work for large fossil fuel companies. There are going to be losers. So am I completely confident that the forces marshaled against that fossil fuel incumbency uh, can actually do this in the short term? I don't think that's going to happen. It's gonna, this is going to be a long slog. It can't be too long because we've only got the decade as the 
subtitle for, for my book, Hope in Hell, makes clear we've got this decade to do what we need to do. But it is going to be a fight. And for me personally, that means I have to rethink my own quality of advocacy, how I commit my time, how I work with young people to help them be more effective, perhaps all of those kinds of things. It has real personal implications for me. Well, I mean, and, and you're a very safe pair of hands and obviously you know, you, you, you're tried and tested. One of the things I particularly like, you have, can I point people to your blog? You have a very, very well drafted and very well written, very well thought through blog. And it gave me sort of cause for optimism. When you write in, in terms of um, av the aviation industry, which of course is one of the great polluters as well, but you write very glowingly about Air New Zealand as being a, a, a force for good who are really trying to make a difference. Can you talk us through why you're fans of theirs? I feel aviation is such a kind of difficult, spiky issue for us yeah. greenies because, you know, we, we know it's a big contributor to emissions of greenhouse gases. Actually, it's not as big as some people think it is. It's somewhere between 2 and 4%, and there are many, many worse yeah. sectors than that. So, you know, we, we do get that a little bit out of proportion. But nonetheless, it's very significant. And that means we have to find alternative ways of benefiting from aviation without all of those greenhouse gas emissions. And that's tricky because it is really hard to find the same kind of technology breakthroughs in planes as we can do in cars, buses, uh, in shipping, for instance. All of those technologies can decarbonize the entirety of our transport systems, but not aviation. So the test for me is how serious is any airline in terms of addressing that challenge? Honestly, not backing away from it, but honestly, what is it doing to take advantage of some of the part solutions that are there now, increased efficiency, better flight paths, et cetera, et cetera. And how active are they engaging with their customers to say, you know what, we're all in a fix here. We've got to find solutions to this. And Air New Zealand is a small airline at the other end of the world, obviously, but Air New Zealand has been so upfront and ready to talk about this stuff and just say, we need to come up with combined solutions here. Government, consumers, and the companies need to come up with combined solutions. And it's that kind of integrity that makes me feel this is a sector we still have to work with. You can take a very hard absolutist line and say nobody should ever get on another plane again and we should use the COVID-19 crisis to finish the job that the, uh, the COVID-19 has already started to do. I don't subscribe to that view. I don't believe that's right because I've, we've all seen in the last 30, 40 years huge benefits that come from um, aviation. From the, from the use of aviation services. So I'm in the position that says, maximize the pressure on those companies. For instance, tiny, simple thought, Paul, I'd love every single government in the world that has a national carrier, a national airline, to say, we will help you through this difficult bit because it is gonna be really rocky for the next 18 months. But guess what? At the end of that period, you will have to use five to 10% of sustainable fuels not jet fuel. That's the deal. If you want to be bailed out, you're going to have to be bailed out on terms that will help reduce emissions from now on. That's the kind of, uh, you know, that's where I'd like to see politicians getting really yeah. creative as they use our public money. Well, do you know what? I mean, that strikes me as being eminently sensible. Is it practically achievable? Yes, one or two. Um, it's already clear that Air France has insisted that Air France, which it's bailing out, will need to source its too small a percentage, but some from sustainable fuels. I think Norway's done the same. Yeah. So it's possible. I, I've, I've touched on this quite a lot in, in, in the book, Paul, because it seems to me that it's these difficult sectors that we have to address, that electrifying our grid and our transport systems, I, I don't want to sound complacent about it, but honestly, that's relatively simple now. We've yeah. got everything we need to do to get that sorted as soon as possible. Um, I know that you uh, you were chairman of UK Sustainable Development Commission um, and provided nine years of high level advice to government ministers. Are you do you still get access to government ministers, or rather, actually, flip it on its head, do they still seek your counsel? Do you do you get to speak truth to power yourself? 
No. Can you explain why, Mr. Porritt? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, when the coalition government came in, the Conservatives and the Lib Dems came in in 2010, they pretty quickly made it clear that they didn't really want the Sustainable Commission, Development Commission around any longer, and they swept that away. Yeah. And as the Conservatives took over completely in 2015, their contempt for sustainability became very apparent. And I have had no inclination to engage with that government, with the Conservative government since 2015 whatsoever. It's a little bit different now, but not much. <laughs> but to be fair, I have to say they aren't exactly reaching out and saying, we desperately need to talk to you about this stuff, Jonathan. I'm kind of, I had my moment doing the political advisory work. I'm now rather more impatient. I get angry faster. I don't, I don't respect politicians for their complete failure to seize hold of this. They are betraying young people all around the world. And it's very hard to sit opposite someone who you feel is playing that, that uh, appalling role as far as young people are concerned. It's, it's impossible for me, anyway. I'm sorry to drag you into a rather childish parlour game. If you had five minutes in a lift with Boris, what would, how would you use your time? <laughs> um, yes, that was when I, when I was director of Friends of the Earth back in the 1980s. I had uh, the odd five minutes with Mrs. Thatcher and I had to be occasional five minute meetings. and I had to be very selective in what I Quite. could actually get across. Um, I, I think Boris kind of knows which way the, 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 the story has to develop now. I, he's simply got to knuckle down and make sure that this build back better story. Yeah. So reflate our economy, put purchasing power back into people's hands, create new jobs for young people. Every single pound we spend on that has simultaneously got to help us address the climate emergency. And we do know how to do it. Exactly. I don't think Boris knows yet, but we do know how to do this. So my one thing would be go and find the people who can help you do the sensible stuff you're longing to do, especially as you haven't had a very good COVID-19 crisis as yet. You see, it didn't even take you five minutes, Jonathan, and yet you've managed to speak <laughs> sense to power. And let's hope Boris is listening. <laughs> can I come to a slightly different issue, which is troubling me, and I've been watching the progress of it, or, or uh, progress is entirely the wrong word, of course, but the whole palm oil debate, that we are watching the deforestation of so many ancient and, and mature forests in order for agrarian farmers to be planting palm oil as a sort of a cash crop to feed the ever, ever enlarging demand for fast food and the uses of palm oil in it. Where do you stand on palm oil? Has the debate on that moved on? Is it, is it still an issue? Is it still a problem? It's still an issue, definitely. It is less of a problem than people think it is. Right. For instance, the amount of deforestation that is being caused by other commodity crops, soy in particular, and of course by cattle ranching. Beef, so yeah. the horror story unfolding in the Amazon now under uh, Jair Bolsonaro's regime um, is uh, off any known scale when you look at the relative quite small levels of deforestation now going on in Malaysia and Indonesia, Southeast yeah. Asia in general. It was a huge problem, Paul. But you have, we have to be fair to this industry because it's brought huge prosperity to that part of the world. It's made a difference in the lives of literally tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people. And you can't just sweep that away, especially quite. as there are lots of companies now in that industry that are trying very hard and succeeding for the most part, to produce palm oil sustainably. No deforestation, no damage to uh, peats, uh, peat bog areas, no exploitation of migrant workers. These commitments are not just rhetorical commitments, they're real. And these companies are held to account by some pretty feisty NGO campaigns. So this is still a concern and Forum for the Future has been very involved in the palm oil industry for the last uh, 10 years or more. But we have to find a solution to this. And the solutions, again, they are there. Consumers must avoid really stupid campaigning cries from people saying, boycott palm oil. If you boycott palm oil, I can assure you, you end up with a much worse environmental outcome yeah. than if you show support for the companies that are doing palm oil in the right way and refuse to engage with the companies that aren't. Let's look at it this way. So hope in hell, a decade to confront the climate emergency. It is a rallying cry. Let's assume that those who are in power will read it and will think, uh, I don't know what to do. 
But let's talk to your readers directly. The people who are, will go to a bookshop, pick up a copy of the book, read it and think, that's fantastic. Now what do I do? In, in, I mean, not really in a nutshell, but what can the average Joe on the street, people like me, who worry about these things, who talk to our godsons and children and grandchildren and so on and so forth, and worry about their future. What action can we actually take over and above lobbying our MPs, tweeting and doing all the social media stuff, which of course is useless by and large other than raising awareness. But in terms of real action, what would you advise? Well, keep going with all of that stuff, Paul, because the uh, contributions that come from individuals is still really important. Um, and uh, I've never been party to that view that says all of that individual responsibility doesn't matter just right. because it's too big a scene. That's simply not the case. Well, that's but there are some things that are more important than others, that's for sure. So what we eat is a really critical part of it. And reducing our dependence on meat, reducing meat consumption actually has a huge impact on your total carbon footprint. Finding different ways to travel, to transport yourself, avoiding the use of cars if it's not absolutely necessary, thinking about opportunities to walk more, cycle more. These are important. Uh, energy efficiency in your home. I mean, this is a long list of things and, and it's not difficult to find out exactly what people should be doing. But I want, to, I want to make a slightly harder point. You can't do this without engaging in the politics. Right. This is a political issue. And if when we think about young people today and we're serious about that, we have to be involved in the politics of protecting their interests. So for me now, there's no excuse about simply saying, oh, I don't, I don't want to get involved in the politics of this. You have to be involved in the politics of this because that's where the big decisions will be taken. And I suppose if there's one really important thing I've tried to stress throughout the book is that don't be scared of that political engagement. You know, that we still have opportunities to shift the needle on what these political systems are doing. More and more people, I think, are taking up that challenge. So one image, which I leave uh, readers with in the book, was a sort of magic moment at the end of um, 2019, it seems a very long time ago now, where Greta Thunberg was doing an interview with David Attenborough on uh, the Today programme. So yep. She was the guest editor for that session. And So you have a 17-year-old young woman and a 92-year-old silverback kind of uh, <laughs> wonderful character who's, who's been such a force in our lives. And they were saying exactly the same thing about intergenerational solidarity, young people and older people working together to make a difference here. So the radical politics is gonna be part of this story. I don't want to turn away from that. We need to be politically active. Pure lifestyle changes on their own will not be enough. It strikes me that politics also follows the money and that we can vote with our wallets as much as we can vote with a cross in a box. So is the suggestion that we spend our money wisely and if we, if we try and convert ourselves more to solar power, to cycling, so on and so forth, industry will respond to the changing consumer demand. Is that part of the process as well? It is part of it, it is. Um, and there's been very encouraging signals in that regard. Um, let me just go to one extra area. If people are lucky enough, for instance, to have money to invest, and you know, most people now have a stakeholder pension and are often able to put some money aside to save. How we use our savings is a really critical point. And the great thing that's happened over the last 10 years, when I tell people this, they mostly don't believe it, is that if you had invested your pension and other investments in ethical, sustainable, funds rather than simply left it in a bog standard tracker fund you would be better off now through those ethical sustainable funds than through the ordinary stuff significantly better off so people who still think that these ethical funds underperform which is what you hear so much honestly they just need to catch up because right now the sustainable funds are doing better than conventional funding um, vehicles. So for me, how we use, if we're lucky enough to have money to save, how we do that is also a very important part of the total picture. And I do go into that in some detail in, in the book, Paul, because we have to see our use of uh, money as an extension of our personal responsibility. Which indeed it is and always was. Indeed. 
There are, as we, we talk, we've talked about Greta Thunberg and the rallying cry and her ability to mobilize. Somewhere out there, Jonathan, is a, is a younger you, a new generation, a millennial version of you, Jonathan Porritt, probably 14, 15, 16 years old, who is, has a highly calibrated moral compass, the will to make a difference, and an understanding of the dangers that we face if we don't get this right. If you were to advise this younger version of you from what you have learned, both the triumphs and the, and the errors, what would you say to them? <laughs> That's interesting. I, I, think, I, I think I would encourage them to look to historical moments where what looked to be impossible suddenly became possible. And, I, and I've referred quite a lot, for instance, to the, the incredible efforts of people who campaigned for decades to get rid of slavery. Uh, people who campaigned for decades to ensure the emancipation yeah. of women, su universal suffrage. Now, we haven't got decades. We've got, we've got to move this stuff along uh, pretty quickly. But the great thing about the COVID-19 experience is that we have learned that if governments find they have no option but to act, boy, can they act. Can they mobilize resources to an astonishing and, three months ago, unthinkable degree. Quite. to stop the really dreadful things happening that would have happened otherwise. So young people today getting into this should be aware that it may seem improbable, but all of the barriers that stand in our way to low carbon prosperity, a really good world for people, just, compassionate, low carbon, all of those things, the barriers can be removed. And I am absolutely convinced that with that energy coming forward from young people, that they will be removed. And that's something completely new, Paul. I mean, I was, I joined the Green Party in 1974, at the ripe old age of 24. These kids are getting involved, as you said, from 14, 15 upwards there. By the time they get, get to be in their early 20s, they're already mature campaigners. They kind of know the deal here. Yeah. And they know that they've got to get stuck into that. And protect themselves, because there's a lot of burnout amongst young campaigners, which I'm very worried about. And, and seeing ways in which I can help address that. Um, but they've got that much experience, that young in their lives, that I'm very hopeful that will continue to build real momentum for the future. Amen to that. Final question for me, Jonathan, is this. So we talked about COP26 being postponed, but it strikes me there may be an opportunity here. Had COP26 gone ahead, had COVID not happened, it would have been yet another COP. But COVID has happened. And during this postponement period for COP26, the, the um, Convention of Part, Conference of the Parties, it strikes me that the nature of COP26, when it is reconvened, will be very different. Were you <clears throat> to get those who contribute to COP26 to change their mindset and learn something from the COVID-19 <clears throat> um, uh, 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 pandemic, yeah. what would you hope that they would see that would refocus or recalibrate the ambitions of COP? Yeah, no, it's a very good point. And it's funny because in a way, because it'll now go to the end of 2021, so it's, it's yeah. been postponed by a year, not just by six months, by a year. Um, most of what we need to do to get our economies back on their feet again, much of that will already be underway big time by the end of 2021. We're going to see trillions of dollars, yeah. Paul. The estimates here, anywhere between five and ten trillion dollars putting in energy putting vitality back into our economies now honestly this is no exaggeration the way in which those trillions of dollars are spent will determine the future of humankind yes because if we use that money sensibly to do all the things we can do around decarbonizing our economies encouraging uh, energy efficient homes revamping our transport systems, looking at different ways of producing our food, protecting the natural world. If we spend those trillions of dollars addressing the climate emergency and the damage done to nature, then by the end of 2021, we will actually know what the trajectory looks like through to the end of the decade, yeah. through to 2030. So hopefully by the time we see those politicians get together again in uh, COP26 at the end of 2021, actually will already be significantly down the road 
of a full-on recovery program which is simultaneously dealing with the climate emergency. So it's this 18 months that, in a way, for me, will determine the whole of the rest of the month's prospects for humankind. It's a hell of an opportunity, is the way you frame it. It is. Are you optimistic? I am, I'm loath, as you probably spotted, Paul, to use the word optimism, because if you look at the world as... It's <laughs> terms of what it, optimism, are you hopeful, uh, are you hopeful I that am some hopeful. decisions I, will be taken by the right people at the right time yes. and with the right outcome? I am hopeful, and oddly enough, I'm more hopeful because of the possibility of learning from COVID-19 and factoring that now into all of our economic and social programs for the future. Jonathan, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. I always feel somewhat humbled and slightly more, um, more optimistic, to use that dread word, um, after we've spoken. Uh, congratulations on Hope in Hell, a decade to confront the climate emergency. It's published by Simon & Schuster. It is due out on the 25th of June. We'd be very honored to have Jonathan in advance of publication to mark World Environment Day on the 5th of June, 2020. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you're keeping well. We hope you're staying safe. Jonathan, thank you for taking the time to come and join us. And My pleasure. Us and to our audience. It's been a real, a, a real privilege. As ever, ladies and gents, look after yourselves. Stay well, stay alert. And thank you for coming to join us. Cheerio.